Good morning. Good morning. Ah, it's great to be here. <clears throat> Got a little choked up on that last song. There's a little disabled friend of mine back where, uh, where I have, uh, we have a disability praise team. It's pretty awesome. And uh, his name is Travis. So I call out to Travis because he's liable to see this. Uh, that's his favorite song. He has trouble breathing. And every year he has two or three episodes where we actually think he's going to die, but, but he carries on. So it's a great thing. All right. Um, as Wayne said earlier, uh, I came from an airline industry. So if I talk kind of loud, <clears throat> you guys just take care of it out there because I'm a big mouth. Uh, I, it is good to be with you. I'm the COO. used to be the executive director, but we wanted to move in a different direction. Uh, I felt it was upon us that we start reaching out because there were some unbelievable statistics about people who are affected by disability. And I'm going to go over those in a little bit. Okay, but uh, just to, if you don't know, if you're not familiar with Ability Ministry, we have group homes for adults with developmental disabilities, and we work with churches in the United States and around the world to help them develop a plan to reach out to their disability community. We create resources to teach them about Christ. For example, we create video and printed lessons for adults with developmental disabilities. You need to go to our website, uh, and it's really easy, abilityministry.com, and check out some of these things because we have a blast. They're 50% humor and 50% uh, I guess, gospel. Uh, they're great. Uh, we just created a resource called Gospel in Colors that uses colors to help uh, people understand the plan of salvation for those who have difficulty comprehending words. And we also, also have a baptism workbook that's being used in a lot of places now around the world, uh, and that is in video, print, and even Braille formats. So it's pretty cool, and we're pretty proud of that stuff. Our official home is in Louisville, Tennessee, uh, but our leadership, we have four, four people, and we live kind of all over the place. But I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, and I have been in, minist in this ministry for 15 years, and prior to that, I was full-time um, at De Delta Airlines, um, so it's been quite an interesting ride for me. Uh, more information, again, about Ability Ministry is abilityministry.com, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. I'm glad to be back here at Northampton. Uh, Thirteen years ago, I came and, and I spoke here, uh, and I did such an incredible job. Thirteen years later, I got to come back. <laughs> no, that's, a lot of things went on through that. I just want to say thank you for being a great supporter. Uh, of Ability Ministry. You've done it uh, long before I came on board back in 2009. Um, but, you know, as I go around to churches and speak, I always find it a little bit difficult deciding what to preach about. Okay, now, you know, we always give updates, but that can get, te can get tedious and, and doesn't necessarily always help. Um, but um, every church is on a journey. And, and I really don't know your journey uh, so it, it makes me kind of, you know, okay, what do I need to speak? What can I, what can I do? Leadership is always, or should always, be looking for what their church needs, right? Uh, maybe a church is not very friendly. Then you preach on loving and, and, and welcoming your neighbor, you know. What if a church has experienced great pain? My friend Drew was called to a church where uh, the senior pastor and youth pastor had to leave due to some inappropriate relationships. Uh, very painful mistakes. Very painful. Drew spent, and I get a hold of this, Drew spent one year teaching and preaching trust. It was tough, but he knew, he knew the journey that that church was on. So now I just met Wayne today for the first time. Uh, and, but my guess is when he starts developing a sermon series, he's not thinking about how to make you all comfortable and easy and relaxed. Uh, he knows the journey you're on. And so he searches the heart of God to preach what you need to hear, what God wants him to share with you to impact your life. Okay, so the great thing about technology, I've been checking them out on, uh, on sermons. I've been watching what's going on. Uh, I've listened to his sermons on the Plastic Jesus, incredible series, uh, going from fragmented assumption of Jesus to knowing who Jesus really is. The intimacy... 
of and with Christ and even the objections to that intimacy, to understanding who the real Jesus is, died, raised from the dead, is now right at the right hand of God and He's stepping in for us when things come up. So I think it's great and, and it's my sincere prayer that you've been listening to that over the last three weeks. And you've been opening up your heart and, and letting things sink, sink in and, and you're allowing, you're allowing to let that information fill you up to overflowing. And, you know, being with you today, you know, it's great to see it online. And if people are online watching, that's great. Uh, but man, when you get here, you can feel the authenticity of worship and preaching and teaching. Um, and so, I don't, want to, I don't want to do anything to slow that momentum down. So I wanted to talk today about the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God. Uh, there's so many verses in the Bible that talk about the Spirit of God. Living in the Spirit, okay? If we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. Uh, for all who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. Those who sow to the Spirit will reap eternal life. But I say walk by the Spirit. So how do you walk by the Spirit? What do you do? How do you do? How do you make that happen? Well, I want to look at a passage of Scripture this morning. And we got a lot to go through because I got, I'm going to preach two halves of two sermons, okay? So uh, I'm glad you've got a, a, uh, an outline uh, so you can write some things down and maybe pick up a few things. So I want to, I want to talk about this passage of Scripture in 1 Thessalonians. Um, it's uh, 1 Thessalonians commonly considered the, the first book that the apostle wrote, okay, um, and to do that, I first want to just let's let's look at let's look at Thessalonica, okay, this church in Thessalonica, okay. In 50 A.D., there were about 250 thousand people living there, about twice the size of of Hampton and the in the city limits. Uh, it was a busy city with a robust economy, and for some very specific reasons, okay, it was built on probably the best harbor on the Aegean Sea which meant all kinds of businesses were there. And it was a major highway between Rome and Asia. So uh, it was a very exciting city, but a very exciting city can also be a great opportunity for Satan to separate and destroy. So this church in Thessalonica began when Paul and Timothy were there on the second journey. Okay, uh, They ended up getting booted out Okay, because they were teaching and preaching Christ. The real Christ, not a plastic Christ. The church was being persecuted. Paul was concerned for these young, these young people, these young Christians, uh, just as we all would if you left a bunch of young Christians behind. Okay. Besides physical persecution that this church experienced, it could be business persecution. Hey, just like us, we go to work, we have jobs, we have businesses. They could experience that emotional persecution, even fine-sounding argumentative persecution. Satan is always trying to trick us with fine-sounding arguments. That's why the apostle wrote to Colossae, the church there, I tell you these things so that no one may deceive you with fine-sounding arguments. But Timothy reported, and this is great, Timothy reported to Paul that in spite of all this persecution, the church was not only being steadfast in their faith, but their spiritual influence was changing the lives of people. And that's why... We're here, right? It's not to build a big church or to sing pretty songs. It's to change people's lives, to pull them into a loving relationship. So Paul writes 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, and 18. He says, Be joyful always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Now, these are heavenly commands but they're human choices. And these are choices that you and, and I, we have to make. They just don't happen. You can't do it on your own. Believe me, you can't do it on your own. I've tried, and it doesn't happen. Okay? You must rely on the Holy Spirit, the power, the love, and self-discipline that Paul writes about when he says, the Spirit God gives us does not make us timid. Gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So I want to give you just some practical applications this morning just to kind of keep this momentum about loving and serving this, this, real, this real Jesus, okay? Um, so how can you be joyful always? I mean, things, when things are going pretty good, 
Okay, it's, it, eh, sun is shining, family is good, good job, prices are down. Eh, it's pretty good to be joyful, right? But how about when there's more month than money? It's rainy and gloomy. Family is really tired of being stuck in the same house for a couple of years because of COVID. The new boss is driving you crazy and prices are out of the roof. <laughs> how about them? How about them? Is it good? Is it easy to be joyful always? Now, I'm going to tell you something, and I want you to remember this. The difference between happiness and joy, happiness and joy is happiness is up here, and joy is down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart. Where? Down. Okay, some of you remember that song. Okay. Okay, so I want to suggest something that has helped me in my years of, of my Christian walk. Um, to be joyful always. And that's to remove the anxiety in your life. And here's why. While anxiety can motivate activity, it does not necessarily improve efficiency. Let me repeat that. Anxiety can motivate activity, but it does not necessarily improve efficiency. In other words, when anxiety is all up in your face, it's almost impossible to make a wise decision, especially on your first trial. Years ago, I lived in Atlanta, Georgia, okay? I needed to clean up my property. I had a lot of trees, had a lot of pine trees, okay? You can't burn pine in a fireplace because the sap creates, you know, uh, this, this coat on the inside of the chimney can easily uh, take down your house. Uh, so I decided, though, I was going to cut up all this stuff, all this wood and trash, and I'm going to burn it in the backyard. Well, in the annals of my family history, there is the story of the Great Burn, Okay, I was just a child when my father was clearing our yard and started a fire to, to, to burn everything. My mother, my mother said, be careful, don't start a forest fire. Well, you know, his, his manhood was insulted. I know how to burn a fire, my dad taught me. Well, 30 minutes later, the DeKalb County Fire Department was on site putting out the forest fire. Well, that was not going to happen to me, though, okay? That's not going to happen to me. I found an empty 55-gallon drum, drilled some holes in it, began my burn. My wife hollered out the back door, be careful. <laughs> I thought, I'm not going to follow in my dad's footsteps. So I started burning everything. Everything, we could burn everything up. It was great. There's no problem. I went inside for lunch and came back out. Well, I found the ground burning. It was in the corner of my lot, so three other of my neighbor's yards had started to burn just a little bit there. Did anxiety hit me? Oh, yeah. You better believe it did. I grabbed a shovel and started scooping and throwing dirt on the fire. Now, that didn't work. It's moving too fast. I started uh, beating the flames with the shovel. Oh, well, all I was doing was fanning the fire. My heart went racing and I thought, oh no, oh no, I've got to call the fire department. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> I was running to the house to call 911. To my surprise, it was an epiphany, a vision. I saw... On the back of my house was a spigot. And attached to that spigot was this thing called a hose, which when stretched out would carry water across dry land and spew forth an extinguisher. Well, I took care of the fire. But do you see my point? When you get anxious, it certainly motivates activity, but it doesn't necessarily improve efficiency. The worst thing about anxiety is it does two things. First, you lose joy. It will steal your joy from you and everyone around you, okay? It affects just about every aspect of your life, your job, your family, your recreation. Anxiety can even take away your church if you're not careful. But the second is more important. You're stealing from God. God is there for you to lean on, to depend upon. He is stronger than you. He is wiser than you. Do you know the difference between God and you? He never thinks He's you. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. He wants to be on your team. He wants to remove those anxieties. He's not a plastic Jesus who calmly sits by to see how you handle life. He wants to bless you with His power. Don't take that from Him. Psalm 55 tells us, cast your cares on Him and He will sustain you. He's not going to let you fall. Give them up to Him. 
When Jesus left His disciples, God gave the Holy Spirit. Not to walk around beside you as Jesus did with His disciples. He gave the Holy Spirit to live in you, to be with you all of your life. And He will sustain you even through the difficult and horrific times when Satan is trying hard to steal your joy. You may not always be happy, but you will always thrive in joy if you embrace the power of the Holy Spirit. Give your anxieties and care to Him. Be joyful always. Next, pray continually. Pray continually. Islam is a religion. The gospel is not. Okay? I want to make sure you understand that. If there's anybody that's confused about that, Christianity is not a religion. Okay? Muhammad Ali is quoted as saying, rivers, ponds, lakes, and streams have different names, but they all have water in them. Just like religions, they all have truths. Well, before you get upset, Ali was exactly right. All religions have truth, but that's not Christianity. Christianity is nothing but the truth. But I tell you what, when I look at Muslims, I must say they have an edge when it comes to prayer, folks. Unfortunately, they pray to a false god, but they pray. If you were to go to New York City, okay, and you descend to the labyrinth underneath their airports where all the bags are sorted and tugs are running around like a bunch of ants, they all have spaces for Muslims to pray. The Muslim community made sure that you would either see a Muslim taking their break to pray on their prayer rug, or you would see an empty rug waiting for someone to come and pray. We need to pray continually. Now, that doesn't mean you have to have a place at work for prayer or a rug, but it does mean you need to stay in constant communication with God. If, if you're wondering how to do that, I want to show, I want to just share with you. There's three ways that, that I think will help you tremendously in praying continually. First is teach prayer. Teach prayer. Okay. Take the time to teach prayer. It may be with your spouse. If you don't know how to pray, contact Wayne, contact someone, let them help you and learn to pray. Teach prayer. Teach your children to pray. Teach them young. Teach them young. Teach your friends. You want to be a good friend? You want to be a good friend? Teach them to pray. If you teach others to pray, you will be amazed. You will just be amazed at how easy it is to pray continually. The second thing is set a specific time to pray. Even if you have to set an alarm, set a specific time. Do it consistently and don't think that you have to have a marathon prayer. Okay, there's nowhere in the Bible, start at the beginning, study it all your life from beginning to end, you will see that God never placed a time on the amount of prayer, how long your prayer needs to be, okay? Um, it, you know, if, if when you set specific times, you will connect with God on a, on a very personal level, and don't worry about the right, way, right thing to say. Honesty, hear that? Honesty is what matters, honestly. And don't try to pray, don't try to pray a King James prayer. Okay. You don't have to use these and thou's and the King's English. The only thing you're going to do is you're going to confuse other people. You're probably going to confuse young Christians. You may even confuse yourself. Be honest. The third thing is to share prayer. Now that's an easy one to remember. If you walk away and don't remember anything else, just that right, share prayer. Share prayer. Bob was a new Christian who was having trouble praying because he didn't think he was doing it right. But he ended up joining a men's group at church. And one of the guys built a very good relationship with him. They talked about prayer, and they started praying together. A few months went by, and Bob's friend thought he was ready. In a very small, intimate group of brothers, remember what Rain said about intimacy, it's a closeness, togetherness there. The friend said, Bob, would you close with prayer? <laughs> well, they all closed their eyes and bowed their head, and Bob looked up at his friend, and his friend nodded, it's okay. So what started talking, prayer, and then sharing prayer, Bob became a prayer warrior, and to this day he is a great prayer warrior. When you pray continually, you build a relationship with God. 
that you go out in this community, you go throughout the world, it, you build a relationship where tens of thousands of people would love to have that same relationship with their father, their earthly father. But you build that relationship with, with the father. You know, sometimes, sometimes I have this, uh, I have this love hate relationship with Facebook. Uh, sometimes I just love to hate it. But I did see something on Facebook that blew me out of the water. And I think it is the epitome of the kind of relationship I have. I hope you have. And I want everyone that I meet to have with this relationship with Jesus Christ. And it goes like this. Religion says, I have really messed up. My dad's going to kill me. But the gospel, Christianity says, I have really messed up. Better call dad. Better call dad. This is a goal for you to pray continually to have that kind of relationship. Finally, give thanks in all circumstances. Of the three commands in this passage of Scripture, I think this is hardest because you really don't understand what it means. And, and you need to understand it. And I'm going to break it down for you just real quickly. First, first, give thanks. This is a command. Okay? Did you know that when a young lady or young woman goes to uh, the Air Force boot camp in Lackland, Texas, that they are taught to give, to take orders? Okay? They are taught to take orders. When someone says jump, they jump. When someone says lay in the mud, they lay in the mud. The, or the Air Force spends weeks, weeks, breaking their ability to think for themselves. So much so that after graduation ceremonies, they are not allowed to drive for several days. I experienced this with my grandson because they can't think for themselves. It's made clear to parents that accidents have occurred when a new grad has driven. They come to a stop sign and nobody tells them to stop and they drive right through it. People have even been killed when they don't follow that rule of no driving. This is a command, give thanks. Uh, next is give thanks not because, not because. You're not saying, thank you God for my body having cancer or I lost a loved one or my marriage just ended in divorce. No, you are giving thanks in the circumstance. Thanks that Jesus came into the world so that the world might be saved. Thanks for Holy Spirit that is real and not plastic, who cares for us, pleads with the Father on our behalf, who gives us strength, wisdom, perseverance to handle this circumstance. circumstance. You're giving thanks in, not because of. And then all. Give thanks in all. Certain. Third, this is all. All means all. This is a command in itself. It's not optional. Paul does not say, well, you know, if you're in a good mood or this is really a good circumstance, you need to give thanks. No. He said all is all. All is all. All. Just as Jesus said, go into all the world. It's the same as Paul wrote to Romans, all have sinned and fallen short. The same all in Isaiah when he said, all have become, all have become like one who is unclean in our religious acts, like filthy rags. All is all. And let me tell you, anytime you talk about all, it can be tough. But aren't you glad that when Jesus died for all, He meant all. All is all. Man. Finally, remember who you're thanking. This is God, the creator of the universe. The one and only true God. Not a plastic God who wants you to fail or have hard times because you've made a mistake, you're not perfect, or leaves you when you disappoint Him. No, this is the real God. Remember, giving thanks is a command. Giving thanks in the circumstance, not because. Give thanks in all circumstances and remember who you're giving thanks to. It's not always easy, but giving, living in the Spirit means the Spirit is living in you. Now let's face it. Living in the Spirit can start out being uncomfortable. All right? getting rid of the anxiety, giving up your cares to Him, developing a plan to make prayer an everyday occurrence, giving God thanks in all circumstances. You better believe it's, it can be uncomfortable. You know why? Because Satan wants it that way. 
Satan does not want you to be living in the Spirit of God. Satan wants you to live in this fake Jesus who is controllable and requires nothing and is ineffective. That's the life Satan wants you to live. Oh yeah, the last part of 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. The real Jesus wants you to live a life that is full of God's Spirit, to live life to the fullest in Him. Remember Jeremiah says, I know the plans for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And that's living in Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit living in you. The real Holy Spirit. The real Jesus. Now, while I encourage you with all my heart to live in the Spirit of God, I really do. Um, can be three tough things to do, but let me tell you, there's, there's a group of people out there that need to hear this message. They too need to be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. Most of them know the plastic Jesus. They really do. They know the plastic Jesus because we've let Hollywood and other outlets do the teaching. As a matter of fact, there are over one billion people in the world who may be missing out on the message of living in the Spirit. Here's a picture of, of just a few of them down in Tennessee. Two of this group of people just recently accepted Jesus Christ and Lord as Lord and were baptized. The interesting thing about this picture, this is a group of uh, mission team who came down and built a relationship with our guys, our 20 folks down in Tennessee at our group home. The interesting thing, three of them, you can see, you can clearly see a disability. And the reason that is, is most disabilities are not visible. And why is this group so important to ability ministry? Uh, why do we get an attitude? Yeah, we got kind of got, we kind of got an attitude about, about ability ministry. The people who are involved with us know how important it is to promote and, and, and get excited, okay? But the biggest thing that makes us so, so excited about this group of people is that people with disabilities are, my, are more like us than you might think. They're more like us than different. Hey, when they get cut, they bleed. They want to succeed, and, and when they fail, they are heartbroken. They want a boyfriend or girlfriend. They want romance. They want to work and get a paycheck. It builds their self-esteem. They want to do that. They curse when they stub their toe. Yeah, we have to work on that. How about you? They need strength that can only come from the Holy Spirit when a family member or friend dies. But most of all, most of all, they need a Savior, just like you and me. Their family needs a Savior. So I want to kind of introduce you to some, some statistics, some facts about disability. I want to go through them right now. Up to 88% of marriages fail when there is a child with a disability. You want to make an impact? Connect with these families. Up to 88% of marriages fail. Between 60 and 90% of babies pre-screened positive for Down syndrome are aborted. Iceland and most of France touts that they have eliminated Down syndrome because they abort as soon as somebody is pre-screened positive. People affected by disability are abused and neglected at a higher rate than any other people group in the world. People affected by disability desire to attend church. 
They want to come to church at the same rate as others do, but because of barriers or lack of programming for them, they they don't. 338,000 churches of the 380,000 churches in America, they have no form of disability ministry. They have no intentional outreach at all. Now you might say, well, why is that? Why, why, why is that? Why would that happen? Well, people don't know. We've kept it a secret for so long. Unless you have a family member or a friend with a disability, how would you know these statistics? Ability ministry is focused, and I mean focused, on helping churches reach their disability community. Now, here's the funny thing, though. If you were to ask of all of these 380,000, you ask every member if they wanted somebody who was affected by disability, ability to, to die without Christ, they would say resigning, absolutely not. But they just don't know what's going on. That's why, that's why I'm here today. That's why I want to share with you today. Uh, I will tell you this. What's the first thing? What's the first thing you do when you meet a person with a disability? Got these little stickers in the back. You may not be able to see it. Start with hello. Just say hi. It's quite easy. We even help people with statistics. We help churches with statistics. We share with them because we've been able to find the information. And you probably don't know how many people uh, under the age of 65 live in Hampton, Virginia, who have a disability. How about 15,841? Does this surprise you? Maybe. Maybe so. I mean, how would you know? How would you know? But can you imagine if, if Northampton Christian Church could, could reach just 20% of that group? 3,168 people. What if they all wanted to attend Northampton Christian Church next week? Boy, Wayne would be going nuts. But wouldn't it be a great problem to have? Well, okay, that's kind of a large number. How about just 10%? Let's knock it down to 10%. 1,500. Still, still, where are you going to put them? Boy, you're talking about Wayne preaching. One, two, three, four services. Okay, let's get real. What if we just did 1%? What if we just reached 1%? 158 people. 158 people. If we were to reach that right here in Hampton, 150 would spend eternity in heaven, not in hell. That does include mom, dad, brother, sister, grandparent, aunt, uncles, cousins. The time is of the essence, folks. Jesus said, go quickly in one of his parables. Go out quickly to the streets and the alleys. And reach out. Well, we've gone through a lot of stuff in one day. I mean, we just, shoom. And I pray you've noticed some things on your iPhone or, or, or in your mind or on your Bible or on your bulletin or whatever. But when it comes to the disability community, they need to know that they need to be joyful always. They need to see that. You need to see that. They need to be able to pray continually. They need to give thanks. They need to know how to do that. They need brothers and sisters in Christ to connect to them. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, those who we deem as weak, they're indispensable. You know what that means? That means we can't do without them. We cannot be complete without them. So it's my encouragement to you this morning that we're ready to come beside you and help you to reach this group. I want you to grow. I want you to reach out to this community. It's a very much a crockpot kind of ministry. It's not microwave. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes one, two, three, and it goes that way. And we have a responsibility to do that. It's not just something we want to do or like to do or should do. It's God's 
saying, hey, you go into the, all the world. Why? Because Jesus, Jesus sent His Son to this world. He didn't come to make everything sweet and kind. He came to save. And he was put to death. You know, he gave his, his life up. John 10, 18, Jesus said, Nobody takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Nobody took it. He gave it up. And you know what? We have these little cups here. This is small. May seem, may seem insignificant. But let me tell you, this cup helps us to remember that something huge happened. That the perfection of Jesus Christ, not a plastic Jesus that can be tossed aside, the real Jesus Christ, Son of the God, came to this earth and died so that you and I can have eternal life. And there's a little piece of bread in here. And nothing magical happens. It doesn't, doesn't turn into His flesh. But we take it in remembrance that His body was beat almost just absolute death before He died on a cross. And we have that little bit of juice. Seems so little, but it's huge. His blood was shed for you and me. So we're going to take this communion. I'm going to say a little prayer. And I want you to think about that huge, that huge sacrifice. That huge, huge sacrifice that He did. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, wow, we come before You the creator of all things. In, in just a moment, he, God, you could just you could take this whole world. In, in, in an instant, Father, you could have, at the, just the mere mention that Jesus would say, angels, come and get me. Father, come and get me. He would have done that. But Jesus died. And the fact that we accept Him as Lord and Savior. 1 John 3, 1. How great is the love that Father, the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. As we take this communion, as we take this bread and this cup, Father, we're proud to say we're sons and daughters of you. Jesus' name. Amen.